So Erdheim chester disease is a um, disease that was first described probably around circa 1939 by Erdheim and by Chester. And they um, defined a disease that um, characteristically had histiocytes, or these myeloid cells that were filled with fat and filled with lipid. And they accumulated in different tissues of the body. And so they defined this as a lipoid granulomatosis. And it was much easier to say erdheim chester disease, as later um, pathologists defined it. So how do patients get erdheim chester disease is still unknown. It usually um, happens in people in their early, mid-50s, although it can happen at any age. The cause is really unknown. It is um, more recently defined as a disease that is characterized by in maybe half at least the cases um, having a mutation of a protein called BRAF, B-R-A-F-1, BRAF-1. And that, of some interest, has also been shown to be a mutated gene in Langerhans cell disease. So um, there may be a mutation of a gene that leads in part to erdheim chester disease. We don't know at this point whether it's inherited or not, however. So the diagnosis of ECD is um, almost always done by a combination of the clinical features of it. And those can involve most commonly patients presenting with bone pain, particularly in the long bones of their legs. Um, they can sometimes present with renal failure because the histiocytes can close off the um, kidneys and their ability to make urine. Um, sometimes patients will present with um, um, heart disease or lung disease. They can um, also present rarely, but they can present with skin involvement as well. And sometimes, quite severely, they can present with um, central nervous system involvement, diabetes insipidus, or true um, ataxia or lack of the ability to balance oneself. So those clinical features are characteristic. And then radiographically, um, erdheim chester disease is characterized by infiltration in the bone, the long bones, by x-rays or by bone scan by CAT scan or PET scan, accumulation of the erdheim chester disease cells around the kidneys or sometimes in the lungs or even in the brain, as I mentioned. Um, and then finally, a biopsy needs to be done. And that biopsy will show these um, big macrophages that are filled with lipids or fats. And um, they have certain surface markers so that the pathologist can stain those cells for certain proteins. And if they have a particular characteristic, um, then that plus the radiographic plus the clinical information says this must be Erdheim chester disease. So treatment of Erdheim chester disease has been notoriously complicated and unclear. There is no known cure for erdheim chester disease, and, um, but there are good treatments for it often. It started off um, by being treated uh, with chemotherapy, similar to Langerhans cell histiocytosis and other histiocytic disorders. So people tried chemotherapy, such as vinblastine and prednisone that we use sometimes in Langerhans cell disease. Um, it responds sometimes to drugs like cladribine and clofarabine, which are newer drugs than vinblastine, it almost uniformly responds for a little while to steroids or prednisone. But nobody can stay on prednisone forever because of the complications or any chemotherapy for that matter. And so with those kinds of therapies being useful but not very helpful in the long term, people started to look for other avenues of treatment. And one of those um, that was tried and has shown to be partly um, effective is alpha interferon, which is a type of biological material that we make normally in our bodies. But when you give higher doses, it can cause regression of some of the lesions. And then other um, types of biological response modifiers, as we call them, another one called interleukin-1 
receptor antagonist or anakinra is a more commercial name for it. That has been used as well with regression in some of the lesions. Sometimes surgery is necessary um, to relieve pressure on kidneys or sometimes behind the eyes when the uh, accumulations cause uh, problems with vision. Uh, radiation therapy has not been profoundly um, effective. The more recent um, interest of targeting the BRAF mutations I mentioned earlier have to do with drugs that are BRAF1 inhibitors. And those are often oral medications that target that mutation. And there have been a few reports of regression of the disease, but no studies, prospective studies at this point. And it's unclear how long those responses will last when they do occur. So we're in really quite um, desperate need for a more effective approach to treat this disease. Some of us are um, believing that maybe bone marrow transplantation may also be another avenue to explore in Erdheim Chester disease. So it's a, a difficult disease. You can't cure it. You can help patients, but that's never satisfying. Um, the long-term consequences of having Erdheim Chester disease are um, also extremely important. They can range from chronic skeletal or bone pain, and a lot of patients end up um, being treated chronically with pain medications, often involving combinations of narcotics and non-steroidal um, uh, anti-inflammatory agents, but that can be really quite debilitating for patients. Sometimes patients will have renal failure and need dialysis, which is another um, you know, complication we would love to try to avoid at all costs. Um, patients will sometimes have cardiac and lung problems that are chronic. We have seen, um, and certainly it's been reported, that some patients can sometimes die suddenly from cardiac arrhythmias with this disease because of the infiltration into the um, electrical conduction system of the heart. Another devastating um, complication of this disease can be the neural toxicity or the central nervous system toxicity that can range from diabetes insipidus and pituitary gland involvement that can require hormone replacement, which is not an easy long-term thing to deal with, but it, we can deal with it by replacing hormones, but other aspects of central nervous system involvement when you start to get things like ataxia and difficulty controlling how your body can move, that is quite devastating, I think, and we try at all costs to avoid that. So a, a major question, of course, that we have to discuss with patients when they come to us for advice is, will this disease result in my death? And um, unfortunately, this is often a fatal disease, not necessarily in the short term, but because of its chronicity and its complications with important organs that we need to stay alive, it does have a relatively high mortality compared to many of the other histiocytic disorders. Um, that only has spurred investigators on to try to come up with more effective treatments much faster than we might otherwise do. And so our hope is that maybe targeting some of the mutations may help um, at least extend life, if not put the disease into real remission that we hope we can achieve, just like we do in certain types of leukemias.